Greetings, everyone. I'm Lynn Gilliland, and, ba- and we are here with Lessons from Leaders, and we have the uh, great honor to be here with Pop Gay Guy, who is the CEO and president of Intra Health. And we are catching him at an excellent time for two reasons. One, he is in Senegal at this moment, which is fabulous that he is um, he's in his home country. And where his heart is, I assume. And also, he is uh, moving on from IntraHealth. He's moving into the becoming, is it President Emeritus? President Emeritus, that's correct. So we're catching him at a point in his own transition after a fabulously long, fruitful Mm -hmm. career. And uh, Pop and I had an excellent pre-conversation where we were talking about leadership and I just actually had to tell him right before we started recording we got to record because this all we want to capture this so I'm really excited for everybody that you're going to get to hear um, catch hear, listen in on our conversation about leadership and so pop welcome to you thank you Lynn thank you Lynn and just to start with um, how about just catch a little brief about how you got here, like your, your story about how you actually ended up being at IntraHealth, which is quite an interesting trajectory as yeah. a young man and, and ending up in the U.S. Yeah. Um, so I, I like to, to talk about what inspired me actually to take on this line of mm. work. And, uh, and, and, and I like to share the story that it is really my early contact with Peace Corps volunteers. Uh, because when I was finishing up high school, I had a chance to, uh, to meet a gentleman who ended up being really a mentor of mine and who helped guide me um, through what is now my professional life, really. And, uh, and the conversation in those early days were around the Peace Corps and the idea of uh, why were these young Americans leaving uh, their comfortable life in the U.S. to come and, and have uh, what I perceived at the time as, you know, very difficult and challenging life. And, and I had an opportunity to learn a little bit more about what the Peace Corps was. And, and this gentleman, his name was Gary Engelberg. Uh, in fact, created an opportunity for me and a few friends to spend time with volunteers in their villages. So it, it was very revealing because even though I'm African, I'm a Senegalese, I was a city boy. Uh, I grew up in Dakar. I, I, I had not until then an opportunity to spend a lot of time uh, in, in the village and uh, so I, I got to learn about uh, the life of a Peace Corps volunteer, and I must say I was greatly inspired, and I think that's really what put me in the trajectory that I then, then took, because uh, I ended up uh, coming to the U.S. Uh, thanks to my wife, who is American and who was also a former Peace Corps volunteer, that I got to meet, and when we returned to the U.S., I decided to study business, and I decided uh, afterwards that I'm not done with uh, doing more of this development of understanding what Peace Corps was about. Uh, So I chose to stay in development, and um, so I continued doing some work for the Peace Corps until then an opportunity came uh, to work with an NGO. I did not even know what an NGO was, but, uh, but I did have this opportunity, and, uh, and that led to IntraHealth, which was a program of the University of North Carolina, which uh, at the time uh, was looking for somebody to start their operation in West Africa. So, uh, uh, you know, I am... I have spent all of my career with this organization, uh, except for the time I spent doing work for, a, for the CDC, the Center for Disease Control. Most of my career was spent working for the Peace Corps, or uh, working for IntraHealth. Yes. And, um, 
and uh, I was the regional director for Western Central Africa, and then an opportunity came up to come back to headquarters, which I really resisted because I liked staying in the field, but I ended up coming to the U.S. and uh, ended up uh, being the CEO of the organization a year after I got here. And, uh, and it's been quite a journey, uh, but uh, it was just perfect uh, because I had studied uh, management at the uh, University of uh, uh, California in Los Angeles at UCLA. And I thought there was need for good management in the development world. And uh, so I was very happy to have an opportunity to take the job, come back to Africa, work for a number of years, and get back. And I felt I was in a very good position having worked at the field level, or having worked at the regional level, and now having a chance to lead the organization uh, at the global level. And, uh, and that journey has been going on over 30 years now. So that was my brief uh, mm -hmm. story for how I got to, to Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, we had talked about you being the Peace Corps, but I, you didn't, hadn't gone into that much detail before. And I, so I didn't realize how seeing what Peace Corps volunteers changed how you thought uh, about what you, so that mm -hmm. is very, that's yep. a, I know having, because I was a Peace Corps volunteer, I know how it impacts me. You um, but were. I not, yeah, I was. I was a Peace Corps that volunteer. That is right. That is yes. right. I think we said that. If we talked a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah, That's you know, a, it, yeah that other side of it, I had, I never heard that story be from anyone before. You're probably not the only one. I just hadn't heard it before. You know, it's, uh, it, is, it is so interesting because uh, I like to say that because, well, I know because I, I did so much work as a Peace Corps trainer and I know that was one of the goals of Peace Corps when President Kennedy yeah. said that was really to, to allow Americans to learn about other cultures and then vice versa, allow other cultures to learn about America. And I'm a, I think I'm the proof that I'm a true representative of that reality. It, it happened to me, and, uh, and that inspired me. And that's, that's, so that's why I like to tell the story. And where I wanted to jump to is the thing that you and I keep talking about on the, time, the two times that we've talked, <laughs> is, about, is about leadership and the comp, you know, how, what, what, what is needed for leaders today and how it's such a complex um, environment now that leaders are working in. And um, so just what yeah. are some of the questions that you're asking yourself? So it's, it's very interesting because this is a subject I'm very much, very passionate about. And, and uh, I think maybe because I've been so long in the development field, and I have seen some progress, but when I look at what remains to be done, um, I say we have only scratched the surface. Mm. And I say, at the same time, I also see the progress the world is making in terms of technology, especially in terms of communication. You know, the saying that the world is, is small, it's a small world, is, is, is a reality. It's, it's just when I see all the changes that have happened since I have been, I have been in this field, um, I, I find myself asking, how is it that I could do more or better? Mm. And what is it that I needed uh, to have more of uh, in order to, to do more? Because I just, it seems to me that our world today certainly has 
the resources or has in a, re, the resources that it will take. For example, to allow so many people to have access to health care. Um, and, I, and I feel in a lot of ways that we are at a stuck point. Mm. I'm, I'm an optimistic person, uh, believe me. I, I, I see a, a glass half full. But I, I, I do get frustrated and I do get impatient when I see how little we are advancing. And, and I keep asking myself, how can leadership change that? Something tells me that it is all about leadership, uh, especially dealing with the continent of Africa, uh, which has so much potential, but continue to have uh, so many problems. And one of the things we talk about a lot is the bad governance mm -hmm. and the corruption and the poor quality of leadership, all of these things. And I want to make a difference. And I, I, I feel like I've been blessed. I've been blessed with opportunities to learn. I've been blessed with opportunity to be educated in excellent schools in the United States. And I, I want to make a difference. And I feel sometimes that my ability to make that difference is hampered somehow. So I, I, I wonder how can I be a better leader? Uh, and I, I wonder what can I do uh, to, to, to foster more progress, uh, to help bridge the gap. And um, so I, I, and I reflect back uh, and I look at my leadership journey and I look at what I was able to realize. And I said, you know, it's not bad. Um, I think there's a lot you can be proud of. Um, but when I look at how the landscape is changed, has changed in the last few years, and when I look at how complex things have gotten uh, I go back to this, uh, I don't know, to this thing that somehow I don't believe that what led us to the successes that we had in the past is not necessarily what's gonna mm. be, make us successful for things that we need to do in the future. So this is, that's where I am. I mean, this, this phase, I, I reflect a lot about this because um, my career has been all around training and building capacity. That's what I did for the Peace Corps. I was a Peace Corps trainer. I was a language trainer. Then I was a cross-cultural trainer. And I think I, my passion actually for this subject came out of that peace. I was always intrigued Lynn and always interested in this idea about at the time I would I would I must say it was about management I was really interested in this idea that how do management principles as we know them in the US or in the West how do they apply mm. in other cultural contexts uh, again, this was inspired by my work with the Peace Corps, by cross-cultural training and all of this thing. In fact, uh, I should tell you a little story about when I was going to school at UCLA, when I, I was enrolled in the School of Management. But my mentor was a woman by the name of Kel Salzman, who used to teach in the School of Education, and who was very interested in this idea about cultural competencies and working with, with, with uh, uh, training in cross-cultural because she was just a very early believer that, uh, that companies will learn so much, will do so much better if they understood 
um, mm. the culture in which they are operating. Uh, you remember those days in the 80s, uh, yes. in fact. I also had a, a teacher at the school, at the UCLA school, uh, Bill Uchi, had written a book. I think it was the Theory Z, and he was very interested in why uh, Japanese companies were so successful. And he had this theory that they were able to kind of mix Japanese cultures with Western values. So I was always interested in this in this idea of, uh, of cultural, cultural competency. And, uh, and that's a journey I'm, I, I, I'm still on, is looking at uh, how we gonna uh, practice uh, a new set of principles that, that would make us more successful in, in, in leadership. Um, so I, I I find it fascinating. I find it uh, very interesting, and I find it um, very relevant because uh, I just, from my standpoint, we can no longer uh, accept the idea that we're all going to serve only one country. We have to serve the planet. We have to serve humanity. And I, and I truly believe that uh, leadership has a lot to do with that. I think it, it has to do with, um, maybe I, now I'm somewhat a little bit influenced by some of the literature that I was just browsing through on, on, on this book um, that you shared with me. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I think there's this dimension of leadership uh, certainly in our nonprofit world that I think is an integral part of, well, making this world a better place. I know it's a, it's, it's a saying, mm -hmm. but, but I think that's what it is. I think that's the principle that guides all of us in the nonprofit sector, uh, that if we are to be successful, then we need to embrace this way of looking at how we lead and who we lead um, because then you soon realize oh my god it is it is complex it is not the simple easy world that i think we were in let's say 30 short years ago mm. where all we wanted to do was solve some a few problems make sure children are vaccinated uh, make sure women go to the health center to deliver. Uh, but that's no longer enough. I think, I think you, you, you soon realize, oh my God, it's not enough to just give people health care. You have to take care of their education need and you have to take care of their food security because if they don't eat well, certainly they're not going to worry about their health. So there is a complexity that I think uh, we are faced with today. And, um, and for me, uh, the biggest, most interesting part of the journey is when we factor in this idea of sustainable. Mm. It's sustainable development because it's very clear to me that the day of the, what I like to call the missionary model of development, where basically there are people who are endowed, who are resourced, and who want to help, who then help people who need them. I think we've, we've passed that, and I think we've out outgrown that mode of development. So, and I think the big question is that how do we really get to sustainable development and how do we lead in a way that's going to lead to sustained development. These are the, the things that make it to me very exciting and these are uh, the things that 
excite me every day. I wake up and I, and I think about how do we do that? How do we accelerate progress? Um, so when I speak uh, about my favorite subject, which is human resources development and, and the health workforce crisis and all of that, this is where I like to go because mm. I say, I like to say it's, it's not just that we are short a uh, few million health workers. It's like we are not able to get the best out of the few health workers that we have. Um, so, it, yeah. yeah, so these are the kind of things that, that I think are, it, uh, for me, it makes leadership, uh, the leadership journey, whether it's you're training it or whether you're trying to improve your own leadership or you're looking at how to, um, how to create the atmosphere for better leadership to, to, to be exercised in the country that we have. These are the things that, that uh, I grapple with, and, I, and it's not just a course that you can teach. <laughs> it's, it's how do we do that? Um, so, um, so this idea that we are in a world that is very, very different today because it's, it's complex, it's volatile, it's unpredictable. Uh, you know, this, this VUCA idea um, I, I, makes a lot of sense to me. And, and, I, and I, uh, it makes me say very loud, uh, uh, yeah, we need a new kind of leadership. Uh, and we need to do something about leadership. We need to supplement whatever leadership um, we can learn in school or in the classroom uh, with, with something else. It seems when I listen to you, it feels like there's two parts, but they go together. One is a new leadership. Yeah. In fact, I wrote down that last time we talked, you said there is a call for a new way of leading. Yeah. So, and because, because the, so I, I'm trying to get, paraphrase you, mm -hmm. the complexity of the situation, the, the style of leadership isn't enough. It's not going to work. That's right. And then it matches with the, and the way we've been doing delivering programs or delivering services or trying mm -hmm. to develop, help mm -hmm. others develop is not also that model is no longer, we have to Correct. redo it. So these two go together, a new leadership for this, for this mm -hmm. new way of, I'm saying delivering services, yep. but that's not what I mean, doing programming. Yeah. Right. So those, that's correct. and they're connected, right? They go, they you, are. you, they are. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I, I believe they are because it's, um, I think the bottom line is, I, I, the, my interpretation of it is that I think it's, we need to, we need to go through this journey of going beyond focusing on ourselves. Mm. Learn, which I think as I reflect back about my journey, it was all about me and how do I be a, be a better leader. Uh, very much linked to what my funder wanted me to do, what my client wanted me to do. Right. How can I be successful in doing that? If I delivered according to what USAID wanted me to do, then I was successful. Um, if I delivered according to what the project's goal was, then I was successful. I'm finding out that's no longer enough. I love that. I'm find, yeah, I'm finding out that, that you, can, you can do that, but then you, you, you're, you're left with so what. Yeah. That's not and the goal. That's not the goal. That's just the, that's the funding yes, mechanism. That's right. 
That's right. So, 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 so I'm saying, okay, well, it's, and it's, I, I think it is about, if you're going to make that transformation from this missionary model of doing development to something that is going to be a little bit more sustainable, it is about empowering people to do it themselves, right? And we have to so, think of a new way to say empowering people, though, because that's like yes, so yes. down. And I, don't I know the, so much agree. I don't know what the right <laughs> way is to say it, but we're not empowering them. We're I empowering am them. so much with you. On removing, that helping remove <laughs> obstacles, or I don't know what it is. Okay, but I know what you mean. Uh, or uh, yeah, yeah. It's about how do we get them to? How do we help? harness the potential, or how do we, it's about that. I, I you know, the term, the, some of the terms that I'm trying to ban for my vocabulary, that's one of them. The other one is actually this capacity building. Oh, that's good. It is so top down. Yes, I'm gonna, I am now going to build, build your capacity. I, exactly. <laughs> Even how? though you have been surviving in this oh situation. My, oh my God, it is so bad. It is so condescending. It is so, you know, it, it's, yeah, it, that, that I, I struggle with those. And, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. It, it is about, it is about, uh, you know, being a catalyst or whatever that is that you're doing. <laughs> I wonder, Pop, though, if like we, what is the word? If it's not empowering, if it's identifying what is exactly trying to happen here, yeah. that will help figure out what is the new model. Yeah. And what is, and then what is the, so I'm making this up, what is the leadership then that rec brings out that, or not yeah. brings it out, we're not bringing it out, we're we are, clearing the space, or... Yeah, yeah, it is, you know, if you, if you stay, it is about facilitating something, but it is about creating the conditions for people I like that. That works. Yeah, it is, it is really what it is. It is about, it's, so it is about uh, an enabling, creating an enabling environment or, or um, because you want people to actually do that. You want people to really exercise, what is it, agency? Right. Uh, so, so it is about creating the conditions and it is about, facilitating um, but yeah it is it is definitely not not this empowering or this capacity building or this because that's that's the that's the one way I mean I think people in our, in our field people development actors uh, are on the right track by creating this whole new way of these challenges that are being created. Um, I, I look at here in Africa, how much the social entrepreneurs are just having a field day because, you know, you, you, you launch these initiatives, uh, you, you provide people with a problem, a problem statement, and then you ask them to, to come up. I, when I was in Benin last week, I visited this this school, um, this guy uh, uh, created this center called Etri Lab. <laughs> Etri Lab. What he does basically, he trains these young entrepreneurs, women mostly, um, and and his setup, which is what I'm trying to replicate, going to be replicating here in Senegal, is to just create the space for kids to come and learn. And because, you know, we, we need to get them involved. We need to maybe give them the problem statement and let them come up with a way to solve it. Uh, I, it's one of our problems with leadership today. We do too much design. We, 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 we right. go too far into the problem solving. 
you know, it's, it's all set up. Um, the, big, the framework for the solution is all designed. Um, uh, so if we make mistake, uh, we make mistake. I was reading this very interesting article that a friend of mine shared last night on how much money the foundation, like such as the Gates Foundation, is spending on the McKenzie of the world, McKenzie mm -hmm. Boston Consulting. It's like millions and millions of dollars. And, and in fact, the, this particular article was talking about their impact with institutions like the WHO. And uh, even though WHO is not very transparent about how much money we are talking about, it's anticipated that it's millions and millions of dollars. So. We are now taking kind of the business model and trying to apply that into the development sphere. Uh, and that article had a little piece when it was talking about what if we were wrong? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it gave the example of UNITAID. Are you familiar with UNITAID? No. Which was actually an initiative. I think the French government started that or it was this initiative to work with the airline company so that you collect a dollar on every ticket as a fund. It still exists, but they, at one time they brought in McKenzie or one of these big consulting firms to design it. And they made a major mistake because they anticipated that this initiative could raise about a billion dollar a year. They're not raising, not even a percent. I think it's about 1% of that of that figure is what they're raising. So they're mm -hmm. talking about, you know, it, it's, it doesn't always work, the, the, the kind of a business model. Um, so all of this, I think we were talking about this whole idea of, of the attitude change we need to make in ourselves in order to do business, to, to lead differently, because um, it's tricky. And, and, you know, this is why I think it's so complex. And, and to me, that's where the opportunity is. Because I think if we adopt a much more humble attitude to it, and if we accept the shortcomings that we might have ourselves, and we avail ourselves for also learning, I think we can be better leaders for the future. Certainly when, certainly when it comes to development. So accept our shortcomings, avail of ourselves of learning, you said one other thing. Um, it, it's also realizing that we're in, you know, you're, yes. we're in a box, you're in yes. a box. You, you don't want to say empowerment, but we're not sure what the other word is, just to mention yes. one, one box. Yep. And, yeah. um, and then we have our limitations as human beings. We all yes. make, are making up stories this, that we have to operate yes. this in success. You know, yeah. we don't want to. We don't want to make mistakes, and so we make. We only work in this area because we know we'll be successful. And so I yeah. think what you're talking about is we also getting out of that. Like we yeah. have to be willing to. Um, what they call in the scaling leadership book, which Pop and I are yep. in love with at this moment, yep. um, is yep. um, you have to be able to play it not safe. Yes, very true. <laughs> what excites me about what you're talking about is what else is out there? Like, what are we making up that where where we may be wrong? Where what else is out there? And um, and you know you and you're particularly interested in Africa. What are the models? Models. What are the leadership yeah. things that are working that are fresh to those of us working in you know the, not in Africa? Think are the yeah. right way to do it. What's other? Yeah. Yeah. It's. I. I think it's. It's. To me, I think there might be some loss of opportunities to listen to the right people. Mm. Or, you know, who are those? Maybe it's those grassroots leaders 
who are so apt at understanding what their communities want. Um, it's, it's, um, it's so, so they're called in this, in this part of the world, the opinion leaders. It's, you go to the, to the village level or the community levels and, and, and these are people that somehow the communities listen to. Um, I think there is more to do in this space. And, and so, so in my journey, I said, how can we complement what big data or, 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 or mm -hmm. business or what they're teaching us, how can we complement and reinforce that by listening to voices that we don't listen to, or we don't hear from. Uh, and I think that's what it is. I think that, to me, I see, I know that there's this disconnect between the conversation in Geneva or New York or Washington and, you know, what happens in the small village uh, outside of Dakar. Um, and and creating creating those opportunities. We started doing some work at Intra Health, um, highlighting and amplifying the voice of frontline health workers. Uh, in fact, in collaboration with some some um, uh, big companies, uh, the Medtronic Foundations, or Johnson and Johnson, <coughs> sponsoring some of our work to just do that, to create opportunities for these frontline health workers to come to, to this big gathering, whether it's of the World Health Assembly and stuff, and just talk about what they're going through and what they're doing. And, and I think it's, to, it's, it's tremendously useful just to hear that perspective. Mm. Um, about, uh, you know, it teaches you both how simple it could be, <laughs> right? yet, you know, how complex it is because, you know, there are all these factors, you know, how do you have multi-sectoral approach to development and so forth. Um, so I think there's that. There's definitely um, uh, closing the gap by, by having having more voices, more diverse voices. I like to say every time I'm in these big meetings um, where everybody's nodding at what you say, everybody's agreeing, I said, you know, how do we, how do we bring those people who are not convinced yet, right? Um, uh, you know, you and I are kind of the exception. The problem really for getting the average American to understand the importance of the U.S. continuing to invest in development. Right. Um, you know, it's you and I are convinced. I mean, we, we, we do this, this has been our life. But how do you get those people who, who don't understand the value, who don't see the value, um, uh, you know, how do you get them? Because they are not at the, at, the, at the table that we're in when we go to these big global health meetings and these big conferences and so forth. So I think that's, that's a lot, a, a lot of it is that. Um, and I think a lot of it is just turning the table really. Um, getting those voices, um, uh, creating a situation where people, how do we level the playing field? And I think that's actually the biggest challenge. That Wh we, what is the playing field? Which is the, what describes the Which is the, the development. Field? So the development playing field, the way I see it is that you've got the people with the resources. Mm-hmm trying to help the people that need those resources. Right. Of course, the people that need the resources are very clever. They watch you, they listen to you, 
and they They've try to 50 see 50 years of fi 60 years of figuring out how of to figuring make out exactly <laughs> exactly they say it and then yes and then they play your game so it's not, it's it's a different playing field it's it's maybe how do we invite people maybe. to a different i don't need, like don't know if the word game but this is a different that's a better now that is actually a better better rendition of what i'm trying to, to yeah, say yeah i hear i hear Absolutely. what you're saying it's it's a different you're it says is. what you're talk if i'm getting it what you're talking about is it's a whole new it is scenario it's a whole different game it's a it is we we meet as partners and yeah. equals and i sit at your feet and you sit at my feet depending on what's happening and yeah yeah in some But ways we have to it's unlearning it's um, our favorite word now just you're going to have to disrupt the system you're going to yes. have to yes yes Which But we have to just, disrupt ourselves too, in a way. We have to start with ourselves. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, we do. But you are so right. I love that term, unlearning. You know, I see myself. I, I say I have to be very careful. I, 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 I say. Yeah, when I when I come in and I and I speak to people and then they say, oh well, you're just an American. You know, you you spent all these years over there. You know, you speak their language, and you know that's not the way we think. Yeah, you know, it's it's and yeah, there's a part of what I've learned that I have to unlearn very quickly if I want to be impactful and successful uh, in this environment. Definitely. So if we. Um... <laughs> Just th hypothetically, although it would be super fun, check back with you in, let's say, two years. Mm -hmm. And you've been very, very successful mm -hmm. in whatever is your dream. What would, mm -hmm. Describe to us what we would, you will have, you will tell us that you, you know now or you discovered or you're doing. Um. So uh, I would I would point to a, a development model. I, I, you know, I think I'm a realistic person too because I, I, I think when there are resources, first of all, I I think it's in the interest of the world to continue to support development work. Mm. Uh, I, I'm I'm I'm. Um, I don't think the the final answer is just to turn everything into a market driven solutions. Although I like to go there, and I think there is a place for market driven solution to what we do. Create the opportunity for people to actually do it their way, and I don't think. Making money is bad, not at all. I, th I think, in fact, it's in a lot. It's in the DNA of a lot of people. When I look at, you know, the women, the market women in West Africa, who are really the engine of economic growth in this region, uh, they've been doing this for decades. They've been doing this forever. They know what to do. They know how to sell. They know. So it is a question of creating the conditions. You 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 notice that I'm trying to avoid empowering. <laughs> it's, it's tough. It is very tough. It is creating these conditions for them to actually do what they know how to do best. So I would see to come back to your question. I would see a situation where, um, you know, the U.S. government wants to support continued economic development and better health. Um, but they will make those resources available, but they would be a lot less uh, controlling about how to design the programs. Mm. Um, that they would be calling 
on some of the people that I had an opportunity to work with to advise them on how to spend those resources. If I saw that situation, I would be a happy camper. Mm. If I saw a shift in the way of, of uh, you know, the institute that I'm, that I'm creating, uh, that I'm trying to set up, um, or, in, or work that, grow, that will grow out of that, um, will be trusted by, you know, whether it's private sector companies or the, its development organization, um, to really get to, to, would be providing this kind of a, a advisory um, services or would be brokering uh, kind of a new way of approaching and measuring uh, the successes of, of development activities. So those are the kind of things I would be looking for. I would be looking, what is the shift mm -hmm. that, that I'm, I'm, look, I'm looking for a shift in, in, in the model. Um, as painful as it, it, it might be today, be thinking about that because I think about organizations like my own organization, and I'm and I'm saying, this is going to change. I don't I don't know which way, but it needs to change. I think we need to declare success at certain level and move on to the next thing. Mm. I want to start. I want to see what that next thing is, and I I'm looking at the number of people and the number of institutions that we would see taking on some of the, you know, you know lessening the burden a little bit on, and so you'd see a lot less, uh, a lot fewer big Geneva-based meetings uh, you know, to design global project, and then you would see much more homegrown uh, type of activities, you know, design. Uh, the type of grassroots activities that, I don't know which field you are in in the Peace Corps. Agriculture. Uh, you are agriculture. You are, you are, you are trying to spear some um, Cacao. local... Cacao. Yeah. I worked on cocoa. Cacao. Oh, and Coco. So you did a lot of this kind of a entrepreneur type and mm -hmm. how to organize people. And I would see a lot more at a much larger scale of these things. Um, yeah. It's, That's uh, lovely. Yeah. So um, to my, to our viewers and listeners, uh, we will see if pop will be, generous for us to check back with him over time so we can absolutely this beautiful Ab story absolutely uh I, I i would love to because i i think it's a fascinating journey yeah i think uh i, I you know i don't think it's a journey that ever ends i think it's a journey that's always gonna have so many and the fascinating things is that um if, if you know where it's going to end, that's probably, uh, I, I just think it's way too complex. Individuals are too complex. And I, and I, and I think this idea that, especially for Africa, I think it's true for other, other, other regions too. I, I think the work that we have left to do, um, unfortunately, it's, you know, it's, it's this complex situation created by climate change, unfortunately, and, and other, other problems in the world. But it has to do with people who are displaced, internally displaced mm. people. Uh, I think people who are migrating. You know, I, I see a country like Senegal here where the dream of every kid is to get in a boat and go to Europe 
because what do I have to lose is mm. what they're going to tell you. They're going to try and do that. But so I think, unfortunately, our work in development is going to continue to be more complex because of this situation, more refugees, more displaced people. And, um, and then how do we reach them? And, and I think it's going to require solutions that we don't know yet. So I think this journey is, is one that's going to take a long time. Um, that's going to have a lot more twists and turns. And, um, but I think it's fascinating because I think human beings are fascinating. And if you agree, like, uh, like that, that book, Scaling Leadership, Thing. There is, there is. I think they use this this terminal terminology. I think crucible. Mm-hmm. That this a journey is really this crucible of a, it's a place where you're given an opportunity to to really look at yourself and look at the world you're operating in. And I I think it's a fascinating world. So um, look forward to that conversation. You know? Yes, and. Um... Yeah. You have been so generous with your time and your thoughts. And on my own self, I could spend several hours batting around ideas with you. So on behalf of all everyone who's going to have an opportunity to hear this, thank you so very much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And uh, again, thank you for... uh, for uh, the gift of that book that you just gave me. I'm so much looking forward to it. So.